Hello everyone, welcome to this week's Stats250 Lab, where this last week we'll just be going over some review for the final exam. Um, so more about that final exam, it'll be on Thursday, April 23rd. Um, so this exam covers all chapters, so it is cumulative, um, excluding a little bit of chapter 10. We only went through a little bit of chapter 10, the ANOVA stuff. The most you'll have to do for ANOVA is be able to recognize a, an ANOVA scenario, but other than that, you can exclude chapter 10 from your studies. Um, so another thing about the final exam, even though it is cumulative, it kind of focuses on newer material more. So as we went over like regression and chi-squared, um, you'll probably see more of those types of questions than the other ones. But since it's so cumulative, you might still see um, past stuff as well. So just note that when you're studying. Um, so again, this exam will be administered through course.work, just like exam two was, and you'll have three hours to complete the exam. And that'll be from whatever time you start. There's, um, I'll talk about more about that in a second. Um, so there will be a practice exam available on coursework as well, just like there was for exam two. Um, it'll be the practice exam will have the same format and style as the real exam. So I highly recommend you at least take a look at that before the final exam starts. Um, there will also be additional practice problems posted on Canvas. We'll go over a couple of those questions within this video, but there'll be even more for your studies as well. And for further details, make sure that you check out Canvas regularly, as well as go through that Friday Focus video. Um, so when we were talking about the staggered start times for the final exam, um, so different lab sections are going to start at different times, and this is going to try to help with um, the website, the coursework, to help keep it running to make sure that not everyone goes in on the same time and the website crashes or anything. So that's why we're going to do try to do these staggered start times to help make sure that the website servers are not going crazy. <laughs> so um, we can take a look at your lab section on this slide. Um, so whatever lab section that you're in will tell you whatever time your exam starts. So for example, if you're in lab sections anywhere between lab sections 7 and 14, your final exam start time will be at 6.30 Eastern Daylight Time. Um, and so if you don't know exactly what your lab section is, you could always look on Wolverine Access. You can look at your sections of your courses in there. Or you could also go to the Stats um, Canvas page and go to your, um, your former GSI's resources page, and they should have the sections listed there. Um, so we will have our final exam start times that start as early as 6.30, and they'll end as late as 7.30 p.m., depending on what section you're in. Um, and you'll have three hours beginning at your designated start time. So if you start at 6.30, you'll have until 9.30, and if you are in lab sections anywhere between 61 and 74, and you start at 7.30 p.m., and you will have three hours, so you'll end at 10.30 p.m. So make a note of what section you're in and what your start time for the final will be. Um, and so some helpful study material for the final exam. Uh, make sure that you do definitely check out those supplements and worksheets within the lab workbook. Um, so supplement one and worksheet one kind of go over all the interpretations that we've been over so far, as well as um, the work, um, worksheet two and supplement two both kind of go over the assumptions as well as um, a full-on regression type test. So all of these will be really helpful for this exam. Um, other things to look forward to will be naming that scenario. There will probably be a few questions in that regard. So make sure, given a prompt, can you tell me what type of test we're doing? Name that scenario will be a helpful tool for that. Problem Roulette um, goes over past exam questions, so those, that'll be helpful to go through as well. Um, also looking at both the recommended and required homework. Um, and if you haven't completed worksheets one and two, or you have and want to make sure your answers are correct, the solutions to those are posted on Canvas as well. So make sure you take a look at that. Um, so for this lab that we are going through, um, we'll work through the lab review questions for the final. Um, so just a certain set of questions that we'll kind of work through together. Um, note that there is no Canvas quiz for this week's lab. This isn't like a required lab. This is just simply for review for the final, if you want. So you don't have to worry about getting points for this lab or anything. 
It's just for your study. Um, the solutions to these questions will be posted on Canvas as well. Um, so make sure if you want to look back at those easily, you can look at that. Um, and also note that live stream labs will be held next week also. Uh, so if you're watching this video going through the questions and aren't exactly sure, uh, make sure that you attend one of those. Um, or if you, um, not even for the questions that we're going over, just like any questions for the final exam, those um, lab instructors will be there live streaming to answer any questions that you have. So that'll be a helpful tool for you guys to utilize as well. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at these lab review questions. So for the first one, we have um, major and study type. So we would like to um, assess using a 1% significance level if there is an association between academic discipline for a declared major and student type in state versus out of state for the population of all undergrad students at California University. A random sample of 300 undergrad students at this university who have declared a major was selected and each were asked if they were in or out of state and their academic discipline. So the results are shown below with our expected counts in parentheses. So we have this table and we have um, each of our disciplines um, as well as our student types given and we have our counts for each of those associations easily provided. So with this information, we'll go ahead and take a look at the questions provided. So the first one, we want to state the appropriate null hypothesis in context. Um, so whenever we want to write out the null hypothesis, first we need to know what type of tests that we're actually running. So this um, sounds like a chi-squared type of test, but we know that we have like these three different types of chi-squared tests. How do we know which one we're looking at? Um, so this would probably be more talking about a um, independence type chi-squared test. Um, for those independents, we're looking at two different variables, and we want to see if those two variables are, if they have any relationship, if there's any association between them. So given the prompt that we originally looked at, um, if we see um, within the information provided, we're trying to find an association between these two variables, those variables being our academic discipline and student type. So since now we know that we're um, doing an independence type chi-squared test, we can go ahead and write the appropriate null hypothesis in context. Um, so the null hypothesis um, would be that there is not any association between our two variables. So there's no association between academic discipline for a declared major and student type. We can also add in for the population of all undergrad students at California University. So we can see all this information just provided in the prompt. We can just regurgitate that within our null hypothesis. Um, so we take a look at the next question. So state the necessary assumptions and also are, have they been met? So we can already assume that the random assumption is met. So we're disregarding that one, our next assumptions that we would want to look at for chi-squared would be looking at um, that at least 80% of the expected counts have to be greater than five and that none of the expected counts can be less than one. So these are the assumptions that are shared throughout all of our chi-squared tests. So in looking for these expected counts, um, within our table they were already given to us. So these expected counts were given with the parentheses so we had our observed count for, for example, looking at a math and science in-state student. Our observed count was 24, but we had an expected of 36, the one in the parentheses. Um, so looking at all the expected counts, we could see 36, 40, 44, 54, 60, and 66. All of them are greater than five, so at least 80% of them are, and none of them are less than one. So each of these assumptions are met. And one thing to note, um, so these expected counts were already given. But if they weren't, um, remember, you could find these expected counts given the formulas within our formula card. So since this is an independence type test, we can find that expected count with this formula doing our row total multiplied by our column total and divide that by our total n. So for example, looking back at that math and science in-state student, we could take the row total for in-state, which was given as 120, and our column total for math and science given to be 90, so we can do 120 multiplied by 90, and then divide that by our total n, our total sample size of 300. And that should get us that expected count of 36. 
All right, now we can take a look at the next question. So the observed test statistic was calculated to be 12.6667. How many standard deviations is the observed test statistic above the expected test statistic? So take a little bit to think about it. So for this one, um, first we would need to look at the question more thoroughly. Um, so for this, um, it's asking us how many standard deviations is our observed from our expected. Um, so, if we think about what this is trying to interpret, what this question is pretty much asking for is our standard score, right? So our standard score, we're um, given, the standard score is given as um, how many standard deviations our observed is from whatever we expected it to be. So for our standard score, um, we could find that in our formula card to be this formula for our, um, whatever our observation is, minus the mean of whatever distribution it follows and then divide that by the standard deviation of that same distribution. Um, so first we can find out what these mean and standard deviations are. Um, again, looking at a formula card, we can see that the mean for all chi-squared tests is just given as their degrees of freedom. So for our independence type test, how we find those degrees of freedom are given as um, this number of rows minus one multiplied by our number of columns minus one. So in doing this, so we had two rows and three columns, so we could have two minus one multiplied by three minus one, or one times two gets us a degree of freedom of two, so that would also be our mean of two. And then once we have those degrees of freedom, we could go ahead and use that to find our standard deviation as well, um, which is given as the square root of two times df. So plugging in our degrees of freedom of two, we can find our standard deviation to be the square root of 2 times 2, or the square root of 4, which, again, is 2. So now we have our mean and standard deviation. We can apply those within our standard score formula, as well as our um, observed test statistic of 12.6. Plugging all those numbers in, we should get our standard score to be 5.3. So finding the standard score tells us that this is how many standard deviations our observed test statistic is from our expected. So we are 5.333 above, standard deviations above. Now let's take a look at this last part of the problem. So we have, do you think the observed test statistic of 12.6667 will support that there is an association between academic discipline and student type for the population of all undergrad students at California University? So think about it. So um, looking more at this question, um, we want to see if this test statistic basically, um, so this part of it is saying will support that there is an association between our two variables. Basically, we want to see if working through our hypothesis test, um, if we can end up rejecting or failing to reject that null hypothesis of an association, right? So in doing that, from our test statistic, first we have to find a certain p-value. And from that p-value, we need to compare it to our significance level to be able to make that decision. So within our chi-squared, uh, we can use our test statistic of 12.6 and find a certain p-value associated. So using our chi-squared table, we want to use the correct degrees of freedom. Remember, our degrees of freedom we found to be 2. So we can go ahead and look at the chi-squared table to find this p-value, looking at the row of 2 we can find this test statistic of 12.6. Again, with the chi-squared table, you might not find the test statistic in there exactly, so what you'll need to do instead is find a certain range of numbers that it falls within. So within our row of two, we see that our test statistic of 12.6 falls in between these two values of 10.5 and 13.8. So from there, we can get a certain p-value range associated with those two numbers. So with those two numbers, we can find that our p-value should fall somewhere in between 0 0.001 and 0 0.005. So looking at this range, we know the p-value for our test statistic should be somewhere within that range of two numbers. So since we know that, and we can also compare this range to our significance level of 0.01, no matter where we are within that range, our p-value should be less than our significance level of 0 0.01, right? No matter if we are as little as 0 0.001 or as much as 0 0.005, no matter where we are in that range, we'll always be less than the significance level. So because of that, we can go ahead and reject our null hypothesis 
And remember that null hypothesis was that there was not an association. So since we rejected that notion, we could say that we have that sufficient support to suggest that there is an association between our two variables of academic discipline for a declared major and student type for a population of all undergrad students at California University. So remember, we always want to make sure we're adding that context within our problem as well. And pretty much the easiest way to add in the context is to just look at the problem information that we had, and you can just pretty much re regurgitate what you see within there. All right, now let's go ahead and take a look at the second question. So we have test scores and first year college GPA. A college administrator would like to assess if standardized test scores are a good linear predictor for a first year college GPA for all undergrad students at Mills College. She took a random sample of 30 undergrad students at this college and recorded the GPA at the end of their first year of college and their ACT score. College administrator first examined a scatter plot and noticed a linear relationship, so because of that she performed a full regression analysis and has her R output given below. Alright, so knowing this information, we can look at our first question. So for this regression analysis, define the roles of the two variables, which are first year college GPA and ACT score. So think about it. So for this problem, we could go ahead and take a look again at the information within the question. So we had a college administrator wants to assess if our standardized test scores are a good linear predictor for GPA. So knowing this, um, so remember um, the types of variables we work with within our regression. We have one variable that is the explanatory, the independent x, and then one variable that is our dependent response type variable. So in this case, we want to use our ACT score to explain the changes in GPA, how the GPA responds to it. So given that information, we could say that our GPA is our response variable and our ACT score is our explanatory variable. Um, so let's take a look at the next question. So one of the students in the data set has an ACT score of 32 points and a first year college GPA of 3.92. What is the value of the residual for this student? So kind of work through this problem on your own. And when you're done, you can go ahead and play the video and we can walk through it. So this one, um, finding the residual, remember this is kind of like a three-step process. Um, the first step for this is we want to recreate, create a regression line, um, a regression equation for our regression line. And then um, using that equation, we can make a prediction of our response variable. And then once we have that predicted response, um, we can see what the difference is from that prediction to our actual observed. And that'll be the residual, that difference between our observed response and our predicted response. So first, um, creating that regression equation, we can go ahead and use that um, R output we have these estimates for our coefficients provided within that output. So remember the intercept estimate of 1.5, that'll be our intercept, our b sub 0. And then our slope estimate um, is provided right below this 0 0.067. So we can plug that in for b sub 1 within our formula. So once we have that regression equation, um, we can go ahead and plug in our explanatory score to make a prediction for this response. So we can plug in, knowing that our ACT score is our explanatory variable, we can go ahead and plug in that ACT score to make a predicted GPA response. So plugging in our 32 points for ACT, plugging that in for X, within this um, formula we should get a response GPA, a predicted GPA of 3.645. So now that we have this predicted GPA, we um, will move on to that last step of finding that difference between that prediction and our observation. And one thing in finding this residual, you always want to do it in this order that you see here. So this observed Y minus predicted Y. Um, you always do it in this order to make sure that the sign is correct so we can see how, um, how our prediction is different from our observed if it falls above or below. So in doing this, we can plug in our observed um, GPA of 3.92 and our predicted GPA of 3.645. 3.92 minus 
gets us a residual of 0 0.275. All right, now let's take a look at the next question. We have the administrator makes the following statement. About 27.7% of the variability in first-year college GPA is accounted for by the relationship with ACT score for all undergrad students at Mills College represented by the sample. So this is kind of a two-step type question. The first step, we want to verify that this value of r squared is indeed correct. So if you notice within the statement provided, this is actually an interpretation of r squared and interpretation of that coefficient of determination. So for this, we want to make sure this value provided, this 27.7%, want to make sure that that's actually correct. So how do we find r squared? Um, well, usually what we could do is look within the regression output, and usually it could just be given right there what r squared is. In this case, um, we don't see that. So another way we can find r squared is using the ANOVA table that is provided, the analysis of variance table. And then you can see within your formula card that r squared, a formula you can find from that, would be the sum of squares of the regression divided by the total sum of squares. And what this SS, the sum squares, um, you can see you can find that within the ANOVA table. One of the columns is our sum of squares. So this um, SS reg, SS regression, that'll be the first row within this um, ANOVA table, um, which will be found what, by your explanatory variable. So the sum of squares for ACT is given to be this 2.115. So that'll be our numerator. And then for our sum of squares total, um, that's just um, adding both of them within this table together. So the regression sum of squares and the residual sum of squares, just add those up and that'll be your total for the denominator. And then at put, plugging in these numbers, we can see indeed that the R squared that we get is 0.277 or 27.7%. So that checks out. Now we can go ahead and take a look at the next step. Another administrator notices that the interpretation is close to being appropriate, but it's missing something important. So we want to correct this interpretation that is provided. So think about how we could change this. It is pretty slight, but it does make a big difference. So for this, we, could, um, we must be explicit with the variation in y. Um, we have to make sure that we are um, specifying that we're talking about a linear relationship with x. Since this is a linear regression, we need to make sure that we are having this type of relationship explicitly stated. So we just need to add in that particular word. So we could say about 27.7% of our variability in first year college GPA is accounted for by specifically the linear relationship with ACT score. So um, this is a good indication of how finicky these interpretations can be. Make sure that we are looking at these thoroughly and making sure that every part is good. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at the next question for this. Um, so we want to provide the value of the correlation coefficient between ACT scores and first year college GPA. So first thing in finding this coefficient, we want to remember what variable it's represented as. Um, so we can remember that the correlation coefficient is given as just r, right? So knowing that r is our correlation coefficient, um, that should be like a light bulb in our brains um, that says, oh, r, well, I already know what r squared is, so I could, could go ahead and just take the square root of that, and that'll get me that correlation coefficient, which is correct. So in this case, for r squared, um, we can take the square root of that since we found that earlier. So this 0 0.2770, square root of that gets us 0.5263. So once you find this, though, you want to make sure that you have the correct association or the correct sign for this correlation coefficient. So you have to consider the direction of that relationship. Um, you you want to make sure that it is the same as the slope that we have provided. So if our slope is positive, that means we have a positive association. So in this case, we do see that. If we were to look back at that slope estimate, it was positive. So our correlation coefficient is positive, 0.5263. But it's still um, helpful to make sure that once you are looking for your correlation coefficient, 
to make sure that you're looking at the sign of the slope, because if the slope was actually negative, then that means our correlation coefficient should also be negative. So just note what the slope, what the sign of the slope is, and note that when you're finding this correlation coefficient, that it should be the same as the sign of the slope. All right, so next question. Provide an interpretation of the slope for the estimated regression line. Be sure to include any necessary values, context, and units. So for this one, um, we're looking at our particular interpretation. So um, it would be helpful to kind of look at our um, worksheet one, supplement one. I think both of these go over most, if not all, these interpretations. Um, you could also look at the lab slides um, for regression. And I know these go over the interpretation of slope as well as within chapter 11 of our lecture notes. So if you're ever wondering what um, these interpretations, those are good resources to look at. So specifically for a slope interpretation, in context, we could say for every one point increase in ACT score, so ACT score is our explanatory variable, for every one point increase in our explanatory, we would expect an increase of our slope. So we would expect an increase of 0 0.067 points in our response in first year college GPA on average. So this is a good interpretation of our slope, making sure we're putting it in context of our variables and our slope. So next question, the administrator obtained a 95% prediction interval for first year college GPA of an incoming student with ACT score of 30 points. The prediction interval was 2.62 to 4.41. Which of the following intervals must be the 95% confidence interval for the mean first year college GPA for all undergrad students at Mills College with a score of 30 points on their ACT? So think about it. So one thing for this problem is that we want to remember um, our points between our prediction and confidence interval. So one thing that we should remember is that prediction intervals are always wider than confidence intervals for a certain point. So in this particular um, interval that we're given, this was a prediction interval given. So if now, since we're trying to find a 95% confidence interval, um, we should expect this interval to be narrower than what was provided. So knowing this, um, that pretty much gets rid of one of our choices right away. And then after that, another thing we need to know is that um, our prediction interval and confidence interval, since they're looking at the same point within our explanatory variable, the same point being a 30 points on the ACT score, because of this, we should expect the midpoint of these intervals to be the same. So looking at our prediction interval, we could see that the midpoint within this interval was 3.515. So we want to see which intervals have that same midpoint. So from there, um, knowing these two points, that it's a narrower interval with a midpoint of 3.515, we see we only have one option left. So that should be the correct interval within our choices provided. Now let's take a look at this last question for this regression type problem. So consider the residual plot created by the administrator of the fitted values versus the residuals. Which stated assumptions should be verified using this plot? So one thing for this, um, one first thing we could do is remember all of the assumptions that we go over with our regression type test. So remember there are three assumptions, that the population relationship is in fact linear, the true errors have constant variance, and the true errors are normally distributed. So these are all of our assumptions for a regression test. Now knowing this, we want to see which assumptions, which of these assumptions is checked by this specific plot. So for this, um, we should see that there are actually two assumptions that are checked by this residual versus fitted plot, and those two assumptions that the population relationship is linear and the true errors have constant variance. So noting within these option choices that we had, um, you notice with options two or four, they talk about residuals um, have constant variance and normally distributed. We wouldn't want, want to talk about residuals within a stated assumption. Remember the state, whenever we state assumptions, we state them with our population parameters. And whenever we're talking about 
errors, um, the, like the population of errors is called the true errors. So that's why options two and four aren't good for this, um, for stated assumptions. Um, so we have these two assumptions, population relationship is linear and true errors have constant variance. So that last assumption of true errors are normally distributed. Remember that we check that with a QQ plot. So there's one more plot we can check for the last remaining assumption as well. All right, so for question three, um, caffeine consumption. A doctor decides to investigate the caffeine consumption levels of college students and high school students. She randomly selects 71 college students, which we call group one, and 64 high school students, which we call group two, to investigate if the mean caffeine consumption in milligram di um, differs in these two populations for all college students and high school students. So with this, um, we have the following R output um, for these two groups. So with all this information, we can go ahead and answer the questions provided. So for the first one, we want to provide two reasons why the pooled approach should be used to produce a confidence interval to estimate the difference in the population mean caffeine consumption levels. So think about it. So I know this problem um, talks about just um, providing two reasons but I'll go ahead and provide all three just for the sake of your guys' learning. So talking about um, each of these reasons, um, remember in finding if we could find um, using a pooled approach or an unpooled approach, there are three different ways that you can prove if you could do one or the other. Um, so the first way is that we can look to see if our standard deviations between our two samples are similar. So um, within the output, we could see that we have our standard deviations provided between our high school and college samples. And we see that um, these two standard deviations of 52.9 and 53.7, we could see that these are considered similar. So whenever we talk about if um, these numbers are similar, that just means that one is not more than twice the other one. So in this case, we do see that the, um, these two standard deviations are similar, so that's one reason we could say that a pooled approach would be good. And another reason, um, we could look at the IQRs in the same fashion, see if the interquartile ranges are similar. So again, looking at these interquartile ranges provided for each 77.14 and 78.668, we could see again that these two IQRs are similar. So that would be another reason we could go ahead and use the pooled approach. And the third and final um, reasoning for using a pooled approach would be to look at Levine's test, which remember Levine's test is a hypothesis test specific for checking this equal variance assumption in um, using a pooled approach. Um, so since this um, Levine's test is finding that, that means the null hypothesis is that these two variances are equal to each other. So in Levine's test output, we could see that the p-value provided for that was this 0.87. So that p-value is definitely larger than the significance level. Remember, Levine's test always uses a significance level of 0.1. So since the p-value for Levine's is larger than that significance, we can go ahead and fail to reject that null hypothesis. And since we fail to reject that null hypothesis, that means we can assume the population variances are equal. So these are all three reasons as to why we could use the pooled approach. Um, so let's take a look at the next question. Provide an interpretation of the 95% confidence interval um, provided within our t-test output in context. So again, going over interpretations, probably looking at um, worksheet one and supplement one would be really helpful with that since it goes over most, if not all, interpretations. So for our interpretation of our confidence interval, first we can look at that output and see that our 95% confidence interval provided was negative 6.5 to positive 29.8. So we can go ahead and use this within our interpretation and say something like, with 95% confidence, we estimate the population mean caffeine consumption of all college students to be anywhere from 6.534 milligrams lower to 29.822 milligrams higher than the population mean caffeine consumption of all high school students. So remembering that since this is a two means, um, independent two means type test that our um, parameter is our first mean minus our second mean, mu1 minus mu2. 
And remember, our mu1 for our, is the mean of our first group, which is college students. So we're always doing the college mean minus the high school mean. So that's why the interpretation is written out in this fashion. And another way that we can write out this interpretation is something like, we estimate with 95% confidence that the difference in population means of caffeine consumption for all college students and all high school students lies between negative 6.534 milligrams and 29.822 milligrams. So this is kind of a simpler way to write the interpretation, but it still gets that point across. And go ahead and take a look at this last, que um, last part of this question. So we have, based on this confidence interval, is there sufficient evidence at a 2% significance level to say that the mean caffeine consumption differs between population of college students and high school students? So think about it. So for this one, we would say no. So first we want to look at our original um, interval, our original confidence interval that was given negative 0.6 or negative 6.5 to positive 29.82. So in this we can see that zero is included within this interval. So whenever zero is included within our confidence interval for our differences in means, that means that zero is a possible value for that difference. Or, that, um, or another way of saying that is that it is possible for their means to have no difference. So now that we're talking about a 98% confidence interval, so remember that significance, inter or significance levels and confidence levels are complementary of one another. So when it's asking about a 2% significance level, that means that we should be working with a 98% confidence level. So if we're working with a 98% confidence interval, um, that means that, um, so since it's 98%, since the level is higher, that means the whole interval should be wider than our original 95% interval. So we don't know exactly how much wider it is, but since we know it is getting wider, we know for sure that zero should still be within that 98% interval. So since we know that that, um, that value of zero is still within that 98% interval, then um, we can't really say um, that there is definitely a difference between them because there is still that chance of there being no difference. There's still a chance of that difference being zero. All right, so now for the last question for this lab review. Um, these are all just name that scenario type problems. So remember, these are all like, given a prompt, can you tell me what type of test we need to run? So for the first problem, we have a polling organization surveys a thousand people in a large community to assess if the average number of hours that people watch television is more than five hours a day. So think about what type of test we should run for this question. So for this we would say that um, this is kind of a good example of a one sample t-test for population mean. So remember um, Looking at this prompt, we're given that we're looking at a quantitative type variable, so average number of hours watching television. And we have one particular sample. We have this polling organization just has one sample of a thousand people. And we want to see um, if within this one sample, we want to see the average number of hours and if we could say that it is significantly more than this five hours. So this is a good example of a one mean type test. So for the next prompt, we have, in another survey, the polling organization wants to determine if the percentage of men who identify themselves as socially conservative is higher than the percentage of women who identify also as socially conservative. So for this one, we would say this is a good example of a two-sample z-test for two population proportions. So we have here that we're looking at, um, first we're looking at men's we're looking at two different samples, or one sample of men and one sample of women. And, but in this case, we're not looking at a quantitative type variable. Um, now we're looking at certain rates, certain percentages. So I want to see if this percentage of men is higher than a percentage of women. So percentage proportions kind of go hand in hand. So we could um, say that we're looking at these two different samples and comparing their proportions from one another, specifically if the proportion of men is higher than women. So a good example of our two population proportions test. So for number three, polling organization surveys a thousand people in a large community 
to assess if the percentage of people in the community living in a mobile home is more than 10%. So again, one thing we want to look at the number of samples we have and what type of data we're looking at. So for here, we're looking again at one sample of a thousand people and then what type of data we're looking at. We have, um, we want to see if our per certain percentage of people within our sample could be seen as more than 10% living in a mobile home. So this is a good example of a one population proportion type test. So for number four, polling organization surveys 1,200 adults, records their age and how many hours they typically spend watching TV. And um, they want to use this to assess if there is a significant relationship between age and hours of daily television viewing. So for this, we could go ahead and say that this is an example of simple linear regression. So remember with our linear regression, we are looking at multiple variables, um, specifically two variables. So these two variables have to be quantitative if we're looking at a linear regression. Remember linear regression talks about quantitative type variables. <clears throat> so our two variables of age and hours of watching TV, we could see that those could both be considered quantitative. We want to see a relationship between these two variables. That pretty much follows along with our definition of a linear regression. So for number five, polling organization polls people on a regular basis to monitor their changing confidence in the economy. The organization creates a numerical index of confidence in the economy for answers to questionnaire based on a random sample of people who were polled in both 2011 and again in 2012. The organization will assess if confidence in the economy changed from 11 to 12 on average. So this one might be a little bit trickier, but again, we want to look at however many um, samples we are interested in, as well as the type of data that we're trying to gather. So here we're looking at this one numerical index of confidence. Um, we have this one random sample of people, but then we notice that within this one random sample, each particular person is having two measurements. So they have this numerical index of confidence um, each person is measured twice, once in 2011 and again in 2012, and we're specifically interested in, rather than um, their confidence separately in 2011 and 2012, what we're, we are instead interested in is the difference between those confidence levels between those years for each person on average. So because of this, this is a um, good interpretation of what our paired t-test is trying to get across. So looking at a pair T test for a population mean difference. Um, then for our last number six, the polling organization conducts a survey of adults between ages of 30 and 50 years old to assess if the distribution of marital status, married, divorced, never married, is the same among the population of all smokers and the population of non-smokers. So for this one, so um, this sounds like a good um, definition of our chi-squared test for homogeneity. So for, remember for homogeneity, we want to look at multiple populations and to see if um, each of their distributions for the same variable, in this case their distribution of marital status, is the same between these um, multiple populations. So within context, that is essentially what number six is trying to get across, so it's um, a good definition of our homogeneity chi-squared test. All right, so that about does it with this lab review. Um, thank you guys for watching, and good luck on the final exam and with all your future endeavors. Thank you again for watching.